welcome to tonight's event. I'm Emma, I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we are so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event. Uh, I want to first start off by um, noting for the people joining us on Zoom, which I think is that camera, but might be that one, um, if you wouldn't mind keeping your cameras and microphones off for the duration of the event. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat throughout, and I will read them aloud to John when it comes to the Q&A period. And then for those of us joining in uh, person, if you want to raise your hand and I can run this little microphone over to you during the Q&A period and uh, make sure that Zoom can hear your question as well. Oh, that's it. All right. That's mute. Next, I want to list the next couple events coming up at the library. If you are interested in mm -hmm. uh, shipbuilding and history of Maine uh, sailing, you might want to join us next Thursday on the 13th at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. It's actually an afternoon talk right here in the community room or via Zoom for a talk by Nathan Lipbert, who is the oh, former uh, curator at the um, oh, Maine Maritime Museum in Bath. Yeah, and he's going to be talking about his book yeah, called Two Centuries, the, Centuries of Maine it's Shipbuilding. It's so that should be a really fun history talk as well. And we're also doing, uh, we just announced uh, a continuing series this summer in partnership with the Rockland Historical Society. And that will be starting in May and going through August. And it'll be the third Thursday, I believe, of every month. Um, and we'll be doing some co-sponsored co talks with them uh, on Rockland history. And that should be pretty fun, too. Um, I think that that's it for me. So I'm going to turn it right over to tonight's speaker. John Anderson grew up right here in Rockland, Maine, and graduated from the University of Maine. He worked for 25 years in international airline and travel management, and as a second career, he taught middle school history and English for 13 years. And I'll turn it right over to John. Go right ahead. Thank you, Em. Thank everybody for coming here and those of you out in the ether. Um, it's particularly special for me to be here uh, giving this talk in the Rockland Public Library because about 85 years ago, my grandfather, after he'd retired from the sea, was asked to come and give a talk about his experience of sailing in this museum. So it's a pretty neat uh, circle, and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, my, my grandfather was one sailing captain, but 80 years ago or, or earlier, if we'd walked around these streets or any of the small towns in mid-coast Maine, we would have been bumping elbows with sea captains, mates, sailors. These were part of the dynamism of the community. And uh, so I, I really welcome the opportunity to share the story of one captain and by that way, maybe bring the, these people a little bit back into our present day and have a sense of who they were and, and, and what they did. Um, my, uh, my grandfather was <clears throat> a captain who sailed for nearly 50 years, both in Sweden and around the world, and then 42 years in the Atlantic coastal trade in Maine. But I always thought this quotation from Admiral Arleigh Burke was a, a wonderful quotation in capturing the temperament and personality that these captains needed to have. Uh, neither timid nor reckless men should go to sea. This equanimity of character, this ability to deal with terrible, stressful situations and calm, you know, and, with, and master both of them. And also, as, as I mentioned, because <clears throat> He was one of many captains who lived uh, in this area, and he, he started in Stonington, and then he moved his sailing base to Camden, and in the last 22 years, he was sailing out of Rockland. And I think I, I, I always like to start my presentation by mentioning aloud again, in the city which they lived in, too, or in the community that they were a part of, the names of his friends, who were also captains, who were also part of the vibrancy of the Rockland uh, seafaring uh, culture. Captain Richard Snow, Captain John Snow, Captain Nils Nelson, Captain Harry Johnson, real name is Henrik Johansson, Captain Arthur Thomas, Captain A.B. Norton, Captain Gus Arhaus, Captain Arthur Wingfield, Captain John Bernay, who I think at one point was the mayor of Rockland, Captain John Stevens, Captain Burtis Wasson, and Captain Cortland Perry. In my grandfather's journals, which I transcribed over 30 years of his journals, he mentioned something like 240 different captains, that these were the ones who were most frequently mentioned who were his friends even after he retired and uh, a, a thought for them as well. My grandfather grew up in wealth and privilege in a farming community in Southern Sweden. Uh, his mother and father you see here were both um, children of wealthy farmers. They owned multiple farms. They grew up with servants and maids um, field hands. It was, it was a remarkable 
um, remarkably privileged um, upbringing. And my grandfather was the uh, firstborn son of a firstborn son. So as a child, he would have had the expectation that he would take over all this wealth and all these farms. But he was born right at the beginning. He was born in the middle 1860s. He was uh, right at the beginning of a, of a time in Sweden of enormous economic turmoil and change, driven by overpopulation, by collapses of grain markets, various things. And so a lot of the wealthy farmers of Sweden were under enormous pressure, and his family was no different. So at some point as he went through his teenage years, <clears throat> and growing up where he did in southern Sweden, he was exposed to farming, but he was right on the Baltic Sea. So he was also exposed to the seagoing life. And whether he saw, we'll never know, whether he saw the writing on the wall of the economic turmoil that was about to beset Sweden and his family, <clears throat> he, at the age of 15, he got it in his head that he wanted to go to sea. And this is the boyhood home that he left. Um, he would see it again over the next five and a half years before he uh, left for America. And I had the privilege of going back and finding this, this home and realizing that the people who were living there were my cousins. It had stayed within the family all those years. Uh, and the house looks just as it does in this picture from the early 1900s. So at the age of 16, he set it off, headed off for Malmo, Sweden and signed on uh, as, a, as a junior boy on a, on a bark, a, a Swedish bark. And I, I think there might have been some strings pulled to get him on there because he was only barely five feet tall. And when he arrived on the dock and presented himself to the captain, as he described to his children, the captain was so disgusted by my stature that he insisted I do a test of, of skill and bravery and had me climb up to the top of the mast and put my cap on the ball, which he had grown up climbing church steeples and trees. He had no fear of height. And my father had no fear of height. I did not inherit that. Uh, but uh, he went up and, and he, he worked his way and he set off on a five and a half year <clears throat> round the world sailing experience. Um, so, he, excuse me, he left in September of 1880 at 16 years old. While he was in uh, New Orleans in America, he received a letter from his 15 year old sister advising him that his father had died suddenly of, of an of a infection in his lungs um, at the age of only 42. Sweden at that time was an intensely patriarchal society. So his poor mother, who had eight children um, uh, and was dealing, and they were dealing with all the financial problems. They were trying to patch things together and keep the farms going and not lose their money. Suddenly their father is gone and it cast their family into a, a tremendously dicey situation. And because women in Sweden then had no legal standing, without a male to represent them, regardless of how old they were, they had to have a male sponsor. Um, and her sponsors were uh, not good guys uh, as far as taking care of her finances. And over the next years, while he's sailing around the world, my grandfather would send money home to help his mother and, and his remaining younger sibling. But he could see through letters and visits home that they lost that farm, and then they lost this other farm, and now they've just got the main farm. So he could see the writing on the wall over these years. The next year in 1882, again, by a letter edged in black, which we still have, he, he kept on, he held on to these letters, and they were in his sea chest. And one of my Swedish cousins translated them for me. Incredibly heartbreaking letters. It's really a powerful thing. But both of his beloved grandparents, with whom he spent much of his childhood, uh, died within five months of each other. Um, on December 20th of 1882, he experienced the first shipwreck, which would be the first of four shipwrecks uh, that he would live through in those 50 years of sailing. Um, it was off the coast of Ibiza in, in, near Mallorca in Spain. He, he survived and all of the crewmen survived, but it was a near, a near thing. Uh, he continued going all over the, the world, various ports, um, some of the highlights or lowlights, uh, at, in, in June of, of 1885, he was um, stricken with some sort of tropical fever in, in Burma. And he and another Swedish young man were left behind in this hospital, this jungle hospital. And the ship sailed off without him. And in my grandfather's papers is a letter 
from that other young Swedish seaman to his own mother introducing my grandfather as the person who could explain what happened to her son. And uh, so I can only hope that the fact that he still had that letter meant that the, the boy was able to go and talk to his mother on his own. But it was a really, you know, you think of this, this is a teenage kid pretty much living through this. Anyways, they, they survived and they made their way to Calcutta, India, where they were able to get on an English vessel sailing for Durban, South Africa. Halfway across the Indian Ocean, the captain shot himself through the heart, driven by some unknown and un unrecorded despair. So the, the crew had to take charge and, and get the ship to Durban, where they popped on another captain and headed off. And, and I, I remember my aunts telling me that their father never got ruffled about anything. You know, he didn't get upset. He just, it'll be all right. You know, it'll work out, you know. And I think it was born in these youthful days where he encountered one, one enormous challenge after another. Um, some of the interesting uh, cargoes that they took during this five and a half years <coughs> were um, they took one load of, a dynam a load of dynamite from Morocco to Cardiff in Wales, probably for the mining industry. You can imagine the relief of that crew when they unloaded that, that load, you know. Must have been something. All it would take is somebody dropping a cigarette, you know, and uh, must have been quite stressful. Um, one time when they were coming up from Brazil, they were loaded with steel railroad rails, and they encountered a tremendous storm off the coast of Brazil, and the ship was tossed around, and they developed a serious leak, and the captain sent all the younger crew down into the hold, and they had, in those days on these ships, the, the pumps were driven by what looked like bicycles. They would sit on like a bicycle and just pump away. And they pumped away for almost 36 hours. And the, the wife of the, of the captain would bring water and food to them, but they were just basically on these things pumping constantly. And they just made it to one of the Caribbean islands. And when they, when they uh, opened up the, the hull and could get in and look, the rails were a quarter of an inch from breaking through the hull. And of course, if they had, the ship would have sunk there would have been no saving the ship. Um, he, we know during this time, because he left an account later on in his life, probably for his preparation for the talk he gave here at the Rockland Library, uh, some of this stuff that was before he wrote his journals. We know these things from this account that he left. And we know he went home over those five and a half years at least five times for a month or so. And, uh, and he, he gave, you know, he supported his family. He kept them uh, going. By the time he came home in 1886, um, he knew that his mother had lost the farm. She had lost the farm. And she was literally uh, living in a cattle barn of a kind neighbor who let her move in there for the winter when she was pushed out of her house by the government authorities who seized her house. And, um, and she had to farm out her children as hired hands to various wealthy fa other farmers. And this was a woman who, you know, pearls and gold bracelets. And it was like, sort of like uh, gone with the wind or something, you know, um, in a way. And, and uh, he, he realized that there was no future for him in Sweden. And he decided because he had grown up, he's, he'd grown up in, in the Southern Sweden where there was a lot of, there were a lot of sheep and, and things like that. He decided he would go to Australia and become a sheep farmer. So, that was his goal. And he told his family, he said goodbye to his family, he figured, when will I be back, you know, from Australia. And his mother, you know, uh, who was a strong Christian lady, she pressed a small pocket Swedish New Testament into his pocket and said, this will protect you against the dangers of the sea and the soul. And off he went, you know, never knowing whether he would uh, ever get back. And he never did. He never saw his mother again, and he never made it back to Sweden. But he didn't go to Australia. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of him at that last visit home that he had taken so his family would remember what he looked like. Um, he was 22 years old, um, and he, he thought the best place to go to get on a ship to, to Australia was to go to London where he could uh, sign on with a British ship because they were really in control of the routes going to Australia and New Zealand. So he went to uh, London, but there was a tremendous glut. Uh, he waited six weeks, couldn't get a berth on a ship. And finally he was running out of money and, he, and uh, 
another captain came up and said, look, I've got a ship that's going empty, a light, to St. John's, New Brunswick, and I need, I need a crew. So he, he signed up for that. And um, he, it was, the name of the ship was the Oscar II, who was the, the king of Sweden at that time. And it took, as he wrote in his description of this, it took a rough passage of 50 days from, from, excuse me, from England to, uh, to New Brunswick. I mean, even in those days, a sailing vessel, you should be able to do it in 20. So 50 days, and it was light. So it, you can imagine bobbing around like crazy. So when he arrived, uh, he wrote in his, in his uh, account that I left her at midnight as a deserter which always sounds like a good line for a country music song or something. But he, uh, he said, I, I've had it with this. And he signed on almost immediately with an American sailing captain. And he sailed for the next year up and down the Atlantic coast on a, ver a variety of American captain, American vessels, schooners. He had been sailing barks and barking teams. And sometime during that year, and I don't know how much the horrible crossing, his, which we know is about it, probably his 11th crossing of the Atlantic, um, you know, affected him. Like he just didn't want to go back and go across that ocean again. Um, or, 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 or more likely, uh, because what he told his children, being exposed to American captains, it gave him a different view of, of life. Because the captains on the Swedish ships and the British ships, the Norwegian ships, they were very class leveled and and uh you know the, the the people who were not captains they were like treated like dirt whereas the american captains it was very democratic they called each other by their first names you know you were expected to, to hop to and do your job and there was no no brooking any incompetence but you were treated as a human being worthy of respect even if you were a, a, and this had a huge impression on him and it's where his children said he first began to fall in love with america during that year so um, at some point he decided he, he, he would make America his home and he would settle. And uh, he, he was sailing with a, with a Stonington captain who said, well, in order to get citizenship, you need to have a, a set place to live for a couple of years, uh, you know, a permanent address. I can get you a job working in the stone quarries in Stonington. So that's what he did. So in 1887, he, he settled in Stonington. He worked for about two years in the quarries and then he returned to the sea uh, in 1889, he became a ship's captain, de facto, if not by law, I guess you normally had to be an American citizen to be a captain, but, you know, they, they, he had such experience, he was a, a well sought after person to be a captain. So he became a citizen in 1893. And in his journals, every journal, he, he writes at the beginning of it, April 22nd, 1893, became an American citizen. He was intensely proud of this. You know, he was an American by choice. His kids remembered walking on the docks with him and he'd encounter Swedish uh, sailors and they would start yelling at him in Swedish and he'd just walk right by him. And, and his kids would be saying, Papa, you know, why, why aren't you answering them? He goes, because I'm an American and I speak English, you know? And, uh, and he, but he was not saying it in a mean way. And then he would back, go back and talk with the guys and joke and tell them they needed to learn English too. And, um, but it was, he was very, very proud of this. The interesting thing, when he became a citizen, he had to renounce his citizenship and his allegiance to the King of Sweden, Oscar II, which was ironically the name of the ship that brought him to this side of the Atlantic. Um, once he arrived in, in, Sto in Stonington, um, he, he, he had a good personality. He was a cheerful, bright, and sober person. He didn't drink, and uh, and and he he people took a liking to him. Even and he and he slowly began to learn English, and one of the big turning points for him was being asked to join the Masons, in in Stonington. And this is a shot of him on the right, uh, with a couple of his Masonic buddies at some sort of uh, induction ceremony or whatever. But this was the opening for America, really, to him was go coming through the Masons how he, he made connections. And he had the habit in his journals of using quotations. And once I started doing researching on the book, I realized that a lot of these quotations were right from the Masonic handbook, you know, uh, because the idea was to make good men better. You know, that was the theory behind it. And, and he, he, this really captured his, his soul. 
while he was here in America and while he was sailing, his thoughts were always with his family back home. And he was certainly torn apart by what was happening uh, to, his, to his family. So he encouraged uh, three of his sisters and his only brother to come over and he paid most of their shipment, you know, his earned money, he would send it to him and say, come to America, there's no future for you in Sweden. And, you know, this was at a time when I'd mentioned about the economic difficulties in Sweden, where something like 25 to 30 percent of the Swedish population up and left for America in the course of three decades. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented. But there are very few times in human history where the overpopulation of one place was the perfect antipode to the uh, to the desire for population in the other place. And so these these uh, Swedish uh, emigres were welcomed generally everywhere. But they went as they, you know, he was called a square head and, you know, there, there were things like that. But he really, compared to other immigrant experiences, uh, it was fairly good. Um, and his brother, who you see on the right, Olaf, came over. He was 19 years old. He had just come from a period of indentured servitude on a farm where he lived with the cows in the barn for four years, you know, really rough conditions. He was undernourished, you know, really in tough, tough shape. Um, but uh, Anders took him under his wing, got him a job working in the quarries, and then got him enrolled in Kent's Hill School up in northern Maine, where um, he thrived. And after Kent's Hill, he went on to uh, Wesleyan. And this is a picture of him only five years after he came to America at his college graduation in theology from Wesleyan. And he became a minister and, and lived uh, in Massachusetts for the rest of his life. He lived to be 94. His sister, one of his sisters, Ida, was 17 when she came, and he also got her into Kent's Hill. And she went on to Syracuse University and got a degree in fine art and was an art teacher in New York City and other places for the rest of her life. One of the uh, critical moments of my grandfather and my grandmother's life was in 1890. His, he, his ship was becalmed off Mark Island in Stonington uh, in fog. And he, being a social and gregarious kind of guy, he always rode to the nearest lighthouse to, to talk to the lighthouse keepers. And he, at that lighthouse, he met the family of uh, Howard and Sarah uh, and Julia, excuse me, uh, Gilly, who were the lighthouse keepers and their five children. And they took an instant, this, uh, an instant liking to this cheerful, affable Swede. Swede. And every time he was in the neighborhood, he, had, he knew he could go and have a, a hot meal and the children would sit in his lap and they would take out their English New Testament and he'd get out his little, his little Swedish New Testament that his mother had given him and they, he would learn English by comparing the words and, and learning the vocabulary. So they, they taught him um, how, to, how to read and understand English. And there, one of the five children was Annie Gilly, who um, was, the, uh, was the oldest child of, of Howard and, and Julia. This is Howard in his lightkeeper outfit. They started off on, on um, Mount, Desert, uh, Mount Desert Rock. They were on Mount Desert Rock for five years. And if any of you know that, I mean, that was something else. Uh, you know, they would bring barrels of dirt out in the spring and they'd build rock frames and, and grow some vegetables and stuff like that. And then the winter winds would come and it would, the waves would sweep it all away. And the next time they'd bring it out. And, when my um, grandmother was born, uh, no, sorry, when her, her uh, youngest brother was born, uh, her mother had to be lowered with a bosun's chair from the lighthouse down to a sailboat and taken to Southwest Harbor where she could give birth. But it was a really a tough hardship. So Mark Island was a huge improvement. You know, you, you, you're close to, close to Stonington. Um, but the best of all, after, after 20 years at these harder posts, was when he was sent to uh, Negro Island, now known as Curtis Island, in Camden Harbor, which was like a, a paradise for, for them, you know. Um, and over those years of visiting, you know, maybe 10 years went by, and, and over the years, Captain Anderson and Annie Gilly started to realize they sort of cared for each other. And uh, it was a long time, but it's, it, it's, he used to tell his kids, it took 13 years, but Annie finally said yes. And, and this is Annie Gilly shortly before their wedding. They were married uh, in June 24th, 1903 on Curtis Island. And my uh, grandmother told her children that some of her most vivid memories of that day 
because it was a nice sunny June day and, you know, so close to Camden Harbor, all the picnickers would come out. So she was in the, they were getting married in the front parlor and, uh, and all she could think of was all these faces pressed to the glass outside, watching the proceedings inside. And that was one of her most vivid memories. Then after the ceremony, she went back and, and the minister said, now you have to sign these papers. So, um, so he turned, uh, my grandfather turns to my grandmother and says, should I use my real name? And she, she told her daughters that she had this momentary flash, like, good God, who have I married? You know, this, and what he's referring to is his real name, his legal name was Anders Anderson, but invariably in America, everybody called him Andrew, you know, so he, he, he and that was what he was referring to. So it was, it was a good laugh. They, uh, by 1905, they had their first child living in Camden. And in uh, 1910, uh, with now three children, um, soon to be six, they moved and decamped to, to uh, Rockland. And they bought a home at uh, 199 Talbot Avenue up on the top of the, near the top of the hill uh, where they had, they planted apple trees and, you know, uh, huge gardens. And it was really uh, the home that they would consider their, their true home for the rest of their life. They would go on to have six children, three girls and three boys. My father is the older boy in the center. He became a Rockland uh, marine engineer and fisherman. His younger brother in his lap, uh, Bob, was also a, a Maine fisherman. His, older, his middle brother, Gilbert, became a, a city employee in White Plains, New York. The interesting thing to me uh, is, is his daughters, because uh, seeing what his mother went through and how her life and her finances were controlled by men, and she had no power, and she had no career that could you know be an independent allow her to be an independent woman he he drilled into his daughters especially you know I, go to school go to college and you know I, I never want what happened to my mother to happen to you I want you to be able to have your own money and your own skills and all three of his daughters graduated from college in the 1920s that was pretty unusual in coastal Maine and um, two of them became teachers, and one uh, was a dietitian at Mount Sinai Hospital for her entire life um, in New York City. He, uh, in his sailing days, he, he loved to have his kids when, when, during school vacations go on trips with him. This is a picture of my Uncle Bob at, at the wheel of one of the vessels. Um, this is a, a fun story. When The first time that any of his kids sailed with him, he designated one day as Pirate Day. You know, I thought this was a new thing when, when I was teaching school and all my students were saying, it's pirate day, talk like a pirate day. And I realized, well, that, that, that wasn't such a new thing after all. So on that day, they would dress up like a pirate king and, and they would have the, the run of the ship. They, all the other crewmen with a wink, wink, would have to follow their commands. And this is a, a picture of my Uncle Bob in the costume. Uh, we know about his life at sea, uh, and in after, especially after he retired, we know a lot about his life on land, because in 1906, um, sometime while he was still sailing out of Camden, for whatever reason, he started keeping a little journal, a little pocket diary. It may have started as, an, as a way to just put in nautical notations while he was up on the ship that he could then re-enter in the actual formal ship's log when he got down in his cabin. I, I don't know. But, but over the years, they became sort of chatty little comments on life and personal things and what was going on in the world. And, um, and there, were, there are 31 years of journals that survived. There are four that are missing. And, and three out of the four correspond with uh, the loss of a, of a ship, of a shipwreck. So I suspect that's where they, where they went. And the last book on the middle row, with, you see the envelopes sticking out. That's the little Swedish Bible that my grand, great grandmother pressed into his hand uh, to send him on his way. And that little envelope that's sticking out of there has my father's baby hair in it, which is interesting. It was a lot of fun. Uh, he wrote uh, phonetically. You know, my grandmother used to tell his kids that, you know, he never forgot Swedish and never learned English, that he settled on some midpoint uh, of Swinglish. Um, and so he wrote very phonetically. And this is actually, you know, if we are not for ourselves, who will be, if we are all for ourselves, 
thought it would be. And I, you know, it's funny, when I started doing these journals, because I didn't inherit them until 2003, and uh, when I started to read these, I realized when, when I was a little kid, my father would talk in what I thought was a Russian voice, but I realized he was, he was mimicking his father's accent, which was a, a very uh, lovely little thing. The journals show a life at home that I think, I, you know, I'd like to sort of summarize it a little bit in this slide because, um, you know, we, we often focus on the, the sailing part of it. <clears throat> But these guys came home and they had a whole life at home. And we're lucky with these journals that you get a sense of, of what life was like at home for these captains. Um, he doted on his kids. He loved his kids. He was proud of parading them to church every Sunday when he was home. Um, he would, uh, when he got home, he'd walk up to the top of Talbot Avenue Hill with them one at a time and have a report from them on what they'd been up to in the two, three or six months he'd been gone. And he'd tell them what, what he had been doing. And, and these kids, till the end of their lives, treasured the memories of these moments. You know, My 93-year-old aunt, uh, a week before she died, I said, so what was your father like? And she just said, he was wonderful. You know, And it, it's always stuck with, with me uh, how wonderful that was. Um, when he would come home, uh, his, Annie, uh, his wife, said, I, I don't want you to bring gifts. You know, I want them to be happy to see you, not what you're going to be bringing them. But every once in a while, you know, he'd, he'd uh, break down. And uh, my father had asked him one time if, when he was a boy, if, if you have a good trip, can I get a bicycle? And he promised him he would. If he had a fast trip, he'd, he'd buy him a bicycle. So I guess he must have had a very fast trip because a wagon came turtling up Talbot Avenue, loaded with three bicycles and three tricycles. Uh, for all the kids, and it created quite an effect. Um, uh, you know, the other thing that I thought was wonderful uh, over the context of these, uh, and the course of these 30 plus years of journals, uh, to this picture of Rockland and the, the, the style and the pace of life, you know, it was before we became separated by television sets and driveways, you know, people walked everywhere. Yes, they had, some people had cars, some people had horses, but they were walking and calling on each other. They just, you know, pop up and leave a calling card or sit on the porch and chat. And it was this beautiful sense of community that I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it still exists in some places, but not in enough places. Uh, and that was the life and the spirit in Rockland in those years uh, when he lived on Talbot Avenue. He was a voracious reader at home when he was home. He loved history, especially modern history, you know, the times of the life that he had lived through, nautical history. He had a great admiration and affection for Lincoln because his father-in-law, the, the, the uh, lighthouse keeper, Howard Gilley, had been in the first Maine heavy artillery and they were, in the, they were in the defenses of Washington for about two years and they had a wonderful regimental band. And because uh, Lincoln needed an escort and he liked to have a band, he came to the first Maine many times. So uh, Howard Gilley, his father-in-law, saw Lincoln up close, heard him talk and laugh and tell jokes. And he passed this all on to my grandfather, who passed it on to his children, you know. Uh, and, and so he always had a lifelong love for Abraham Lincoln and, he, and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he was a Republican, which in those days meant something totally different than it does now. But, but he used to tell his kids that um, when, the, when the wagons that would come up to take people to the polls would come, uh, he would always tell the Republican wagon, no, keep going, I'm waiting for the Democratic wagon. And he'd jump on the Democratic wagon, who were also his friends. You know, both, both wagon masters were his friends because he just loved the idea of having the Democrats take him to the polls so he could vote Republican. You know, <laughs> wouldn't you love to have that kind of spirit uh, nowadays? You know, uh, he was a doer. He didn't just, oh, I'm home off the sea. I'm going to lie on the couch and read. He, he, had, a, he had projects. The next day he was home, he's tearing out the walls in the, in the laundry room, put in new plumbing, or he's you know, going up onto his neighbor's barn to help him install his weather vane. Uh, you know, he was just a, a doer. He loved his chickens, as he called them, his chickens. He uh, threw, him, <coughs> excuse me, threw himself into his gardening, his berries. The guy could not pass a blueberry bush or a raspberry bush without picking at least a quart. You know, it's just, he was always picking so that Annie would have plenty of, of those fruits to, uh, to make things with. 
He loved walking in the woods. He loved birds. He noted in the journals always the first arrivals of the spring birds. And I think he had an affinity. He, he saw in birds a sort of a like, a like creature. Because those sailing captains, they, they, they weren't motorized. They, they, they sailed the wind just like birds. And I, I think he always had an affinity for them. He felt them. Uh, and, and birds at sea were, were a harbinger or a warning. Uh, he had a deep love of, of, of birds. Um, he was always helping his neighbors uh, up the street uh, who ran a dairy with their haying when, when he was there at the right season. And in the winter, taking the ice blocks and, and uh, from Chickawaukee Lake and putting them up for, for the um, dairy operation. He was always helping his neighbors. Even at the age of 74, he was the guy that was called on to climb up to the top of a three-story barn and take down a weather vane or put up a, a lightning rod. He, he, he was just a, a, you know, a, a good neighbor to have if there was hard work to be done. He loved to, sl to slide, to sled. He, he lived to be 76 and he went sledding down Talbot Avenue Hill up to his last years, to his last year. He, he, was, uh, he was still a boy at heart in many ways. He liked to try new things. He went, did his first ice boat ride at the age of 65. He took his first plane ride with Captain Wynkin Parr over Rockland Harbor in 1931. You know, um, he, uh, he learned to drive a car at 69, although he never could bring himself to actually own one, uh, but he wanted, to know, he wanted to know he could do it. That was his life at home. At sea, which took up so much of his days and of his life, uh, again, he, he had to have that kind of equanimity and, and um, duality of character that would allow him to sail hard when the wind was right, and they'd sail through the night. He and the mate would take turns pedal of the metal, as it were. And then at the same time, you could come around, you know, Martha's Vineyard and be becalmed for five days, you know, or, or have contrary winds. And then you just have to sit, you know. Um, and you imagine with the type A personalities that a lot of us have, that's a real skill set to be able to shift from one of those to another and, and still keep friends around you. Um, and uh, he, uh, he wouldn't allow alcohol on his vessels. And it wasn't so much a moral issue as it was he had growing up, his father had drunk too much and he'd seen too many Swedish sailors and when he was sailing who, who drank up all of their money and their kids went without, without uh, good clothes and stuff. And he just decided that was not for him. Plus, as a captain, he knew you needed instantaneous action. You couldn't be somebody who was intoxicated or impaired. So there was a practical reason that he didn't, he didn't want it on there. Um, and he would throw the bottle overboard if he found any. And my aunt told me once that there was at least one occasion where he threw the bottle overboard with a crewman still attached. Um, not, not out at sea in the harbor. I mean, he, he, wasn't, killing, he wasn't killing the guy. But he was, he was um, tolerant. He, you know, he, wasn't, uh, he, he, he didn't look down on people who drank. He just didn't want them in his workspace and, or in his life, in his, in his home and no alcohol was allowed in his home. But he was very forgiving of, you know, there was one uh, crewman that he particularly liked who uh, fell drunk off the dock and broke his leg. And over the next years, you see him continuously hiring this man again and again, because he was a good sailor, just as long as he wasn't drinking, you know? Um, so it was an interesting uh, approach that were not particularly typical, I think, of crews or sailing captains in those days. He also started a, a habit uh, in the wintertime when they were out sailing and the last man off watch, he, he would tell that guy to make sure that the rest of the crew had a warm blanket over them because over the night, the, the, the galley stove would cool down and it'd get quite cold on that. And it, it was a lot of these little touches that made him a very popular captain. You know, you see over in the journals over and over again, uh, the same guys coming back to sail with him. Um, and uh, he also employed the best cooks, which, which helped. He felt like, you know, feeding the men well was, was essential. The worst thing that a cook could do is either ha have bad hygiene or not very good skills. And they were quickly dispatched until they got a, 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 another cook. Um, when Annie and the kids went traveling on the ship with them, um, the, the uh, you know, the, the, usually the, the cook would be, when the kids were little, the cook would be sort of a babysitter when he wasn't uh, when he wasn't cooking, and they would uh, cut lengths of rope 
equal to you know the, the, the size of the kid's waist far enough to go to the rail but not fall over so the kids could sort of wander around without tumbling overboard and Annie would get seasick if the weather she was good in fair weather and everything but when they got into these wallows and things she would get seasick and one time she was very very sick and uh, the, he had a, uh, an African-American cook who was one of his favorites that he, he, he hired him whenever he had a chance. And this cook was very kind and, you know, took care of all the kids for these like three days while Annie was just really wiped out. And, uh, and he would bring her soup and things like that. And she was so grateful that, you know, when she recovered, she said, well, I'll take care of your cat, you know, so she was taking care of the cat. And at the end of the journal, he presented her with a chip in a bottle that he had made. And we still have this, uh, that ship in a bottle in our house. Uh, regrettably, in all my research, I couldn't find the name of that cook. You know, he, 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 uh, he, doesn't mention by, he doesn't mention him by name. I only know it because his daughters told me about it, you know. Um, and uh, atypical of the time, too, when they were in Rockland, he would bring the cook up to the house for lunch and dinner, which doesn't sound like any big deal now, but it was a big thing in 1910 and in, in 1915. Um, he, he was a, a pretty liberal man in that way. Um, for Annie and all of the, the wives of the sailors and the captains, you know, they, they were the heroes that are, are not mentioned enough in the history. You know, they're the ones who kept the family together. They're, they're the ones who taught the kids, really, because these, you know, these guys were gone in some years, 80% of the time, you know. Um, so they were they they learned to deal with the absences. She was a strong person, uh, and she raised strong children because they all had to pitch in, you know. And I can remember my father was a rock and fisherman, and he had the same mentality. You know, I was sitting on the couch one day, and my button fell off, and I yelled, "Mom, can you sew my button on?" And my father said, "Wait a minute, your mother's got enough to do. I'm going to teach you how to sew." So we sat there and right there and taught me how to sew a button on which, you know, I've never forgotten. And I think that was the way it was. A, a job had to be done. And everybody just pitches in and gets it done. Um, and, and Annie was a central person in creating that, that culture. But they had to deal with us. She had to deal with, you know, five pregnancies uh, where, where he was not there, you know, the births of his children, um, kids getting sick. And because she had grown up on the lighthouses, she had never gotten the childhood illnesses. So she got all these childhood illnesses from her children, you know, measles, chicken pox, mumps, you know, that, which can be fatal in adults, you know, but she toughed it out and she, and she made it. They communicated through letters. Uh, her her uh, children, when they were adults, asked her, weren't you ever scared about Papa being out, you know, and off for months and months? And she said, well, do you remember when the days when I'd call you all into the front parlor and we'd read the Bible or read Psalms or sing songs. Oh yeah, yes, that was so much fun. Those were the days where I needed it because I was scared to death, you know, because I knew he was down in the Carolinas and there was a hurricane coming and it was really a powerful thing. Um, he was an informal guy. He told people to call him Andrew, but generally the crewmen always called him Captain Anderson. Um, Whenever he came into a port, he was, once he finished his immediate duties, he was always off exploring, going to an ostrich farm in Florida, or inspecting old French ruins in Haiti. Or, you know, go, when he was in New York, he always went to the museums, um, took his crewmen to the museums. Um, and on Sundays, he went to wherever, or, or Saturdays, if the case was right, he would go to whatever was the nearest religious house. So in the course of his journals, he went to Jewish synagogues, Catholic churches, you know, he was a Baptist, Lutheran kind of guy. I went to all of those. He, he uh, went to several uh, African-American churches. His, he, he told his kids one story when they passed the hat in this uh, church in Brooklyn, this African-American church, and he put a dollar in, in the hat. And, and the, the man stopped and said, brothers and sisters, give thanks to our white brother for his, his precious dollar that he gave us. And it, I mean, it wasn't like a superior thing. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't saying, here, take this dollar. It was just uh, his natural generosity. And it made an impression on him about, you know, the equality of people and how to treat people. He treated everybody at whatever station you found them with respect and dignity. And, um, and he even went to a spiritualist meeting in New York. Uh, I never heard what, who he was trying to commune with, but uh, 
that was a that was a, a very popular thing that was going on in the early 1900s. So as I said, he sailed from Stonington first from 1889 to 1903, exclusively um, two mastered schooners. One of the highlights or lowlights of his time sailing out of uh, Stonington was the wreck of the Ida L. Ray. The Ray uh, was commissioned to bring this equestrian statue of General John Logan, who was one of the few really successful political Union generals. He was actually a pretty good general. And they were, wanted to make this, uh, this equestrian statue. So he, he transported it down to Washington. And on the way back, and, and this, is, this is General Logan atop his horse. Now, the pedestal, is, of course, was not transported. It was just the, the horse. And General Logan was, was cut in half for the ride down. His, his head and down to his waist was underneath the horse. And it was strapped onto the deck. Um, so, but after this was safely delivered to and where it still stands in Logan Circle uh, today in Washington, D.C., he took a load of kiln-dried lumber uh, back, headed for Boston. And it, it was in February of, of uh, 1901. And he was very quickly uh, caught up in a tremendous winter storm off the coast of Maryland and Virginia. And the ship um, was, was uh, pretty soon awash. And the, the water got down amongst this kiln dried lumber. And it's just like, you know, freeze dried food. You add water to it and swells right up. And it was buckling out the, the seams of the ship. It wasn't going to sink because it was, you know, just this hunk of wood. But, but the, there was nothing below deck but water. And uh, so the men clung to the top of the deck for two days. And then they finally realized they had to do something. Uh, but the, the, the storm had knocked all the, um, the, the oars off the, the vessel. And uh, so they had to use some of the deck load lumber and carved new oars and, and, and all went into the dory, the four, four men and the ship's cat. And they rowed for, for two days in the February cold uh, using the, the sextant and the, uh, the chronometer that my grandfather had taken from the ship, taking sightings, trying to find land or to get back into the, into the trading routes. Um, and finally, they got within eight miles of the New Jersey coast, and then the wind turned around and blew them back out. They were like 100 miles off. They were nearly gone. Um, the only casualty was the ship's cat, which was knocked off by a rogue wave. My grandfather and another crewman were knocked out of the boat by a rogue wave, wave but luckily they bobbed to the surface right in front of the boat, and they were pulled in by their mates. And finally, you know, when they were just about gone, some of the men were hallucinating. Everybody had frostbite. They were nearly dead. Uh, a banana steamer comes upon them and rescues them, coming up from Central America, loaded with bananas. They hadn't eaten in four and a half days. You know, they were dehydrated. So they were trying to just feed them soup and stuff. And they, they were ripping bread out of their mouths. And you can't eat that yet. Mm -hmm. Left alone for a few moments, the four of them surviving went into the hole and they found all these bananas. And they went nuts on these bananas, eating bananas. And uh, the rest of his days, his children said he would never allow a banana in his house. You know, it was a very hard thing, but he made it. Uh, after his marriage to Annie Gilly, he moved to Camden and Rockland. And, in, and the, I'll just do a quick run through of the vessels. That, and this corresponds mainly with his journals. So first he sailed, and it was all three masted schooners. From this point on, he only sailed three masted schooners. The first was the Annie B. Mitchell for the Booth Brothers, <clears throat> which was out of New London, Connecticut from 1903 to 1905, hauling mainly granite and coal. Then he moved to work for the I.L. Snow Company in Rockland, and he sailed the Methabesic, the Matinic, and the Wallanock. In the course of his career, he sailed six of the snow vessels, which as best as I can figure with Captain Sharp, there's no other captain except one of the snows who sailed as many of their vessels uh, at one time or another as he did. Uh, so during those years, he was hauling lumber, granite, potatoes, coal, usually up, you know, the Atlantic coast from Canada to, to Virginia, mainly, sometimes to St. Um, uh, St. Petersburg. Then he went to work uh, in, in 1910 to 1916 for the Lord Company out of Bangor on the Emma Lord and the Marjorie Spencer. And this is the years where he was down in the Caribbean. He was in uh, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba. Puerto Rico. And they, they were hauling logwood, uh, which was made a special red dye. It was very popular until they invented synthetic dyes, and then no one was interested in logwood anymore. 
uh, and molasses in St. Andres off the coast of Nicaragua, um, they, they loaded 700,000 coconuts bound for Philadelphia. And they, the natives came on on the, the night they were departing and did a dance for them. And he said, he told his children he didn't know whether it was for their safe passage north or to say, saying goodbye to the coconuts. Uh, <laughs> but the coconuts made it to Philadelphia. A um, lot of coal, potatoes. Uh, when he was in D D D Dominican uh, Haiti, and Haiti, uh, he was there in 1916 when there was a revolution, and the insurgents at one point were firing across the river, and the bullets were whizzing across the deck, and he had to, all the crew had to go down and hunker down inside the, the vessel for about a day, till the U.S. Marines came in and and uh, occupied the country for the next 10 years, and it, it was on that trip where he went up into the countryside and explored some of these old French ruins and forts from the time of the French um, colonial period. And he brought back from that these prison uniforms and shackles that were just laying there. He thought they would be fun. His kids would have fun with them. And, and a 300 uh, year old uh, Napoleon brass cannon, French cannon, a 300 pound, I should say, shot in like three, three pound balls or something like that. He brought that back home. And on the 4th of July, my father and his brothers would drag it out onto the front lawn, pack it with black powder and, you know, wake up the neighborhood, celebrate the 4th of July. There was no projectile in it, just, just booming it. Um, so it was it a lot of fun. And, and with, the, uh, with the uniforms, my, my grandmother loved to work in the garden, but she, she didn't like to get her clothes dirty. She'd get, you know, you get so grimy. But she found that the pajamas, these prison pajamas, were actually great because they were loose and baggy and she didn't care if they got dirty. So she'd be out there working in the garden in her prison garden. And imagine all the neighbors going by and said, Captain Anderson, what have you got going on here? If you've got, your wife is slave labor working in your garden. So it was a lot of fun. Um, then he went, you know, by that time, those six years were hard on the family because he was gone six months, seven months. And uh, and it was, it was a really a hardship. And he, uh, their children told me but at some point, their mother sort of put her foot down. And, and uh, so he decided he would come back to, uh, to work for the snows, where it was more, you know, you'd be gone a month or two months, but you didn't have these long extended periods. And I remember when my father was a fisherman uh, on the trawlers going up off the Grand Banks, and he'd be home for three days and out for two weeks, home for three days, out for two weeks. And I remember as a boy at one point sort of complaining to him about that he was away so much. He, he sort of chuckled and he said, you know, I, from my perspective, you know, I don't think you've got it too bad. You know, my father would be gone for seven months, six months. And I always remember it made a big impression on me. I never, I never bothered me after that. I thought, well, you know, he's right. It's not so bad. Um, but uh, it was, uh, it was a real good thing for the family that he could be home and the younger children really got to have a lot more time with him. And, and uh, it was a, a treasure to, to have him nearby. <clears throat> so the, uh, he sailed for the snow vessels Udapayans, the Lavinia Snow, and the William Bisney, Bisbee from 1916 to 1922, mainly ship lumber, cypress, cement, clay, coal, mainly to Virginia, sometimes to Florida, uh, but all just along the Atlantic coast, a lot of New York trips, things like that. And in, uh, in uh, 1922, he uh, rejoined the Booth operation and which was even better because now they were heavy into the granite quarrying at that time. So it was taking granite from quarries, Clark Island, Vinyl Haven, Hall's Quarry up in uh, Mount Desert, uh, down to New York and back. So it was just a regular like shuttle run. And that, that was a really a great thing. So it was just granite south, coal north. His favorite vessels amongst all those ones from what his kids said was the Lavinia M. Snow, and if you go to uh, Captain Sharp's museum and the, the hanging uh, depiction of a ship that's in the entryway through there, that, that's the Lavinia M. Snow. That's a model by Dynamite Payson, I think it was, uh, of, the, of the Lavinia Snow. Uh, the Lavinia Snow, it's sort of funny. It was named after one of Captain Dick Snow's sisters, who was a very prim and proper young uh, lady, I mean, an older lady. And one time she was walking through the shipyard when they had the, her boat, as she called it, the Lavinia M. Snow up on the, the ways and they were scraping the bottom. And she heard one of the crewmen say, yeah, we've got to scrape the bottom. We've got to scrape her bottom. And she went to her brother and said, really, you can't be talking about my ship like that. You've got to come up with a more refined way of that. 
So he had to go and tell the guys, hey, just cool it with GCA, you know. Uh, it was launched in 1893, driven ashore under a different captain uh, near Hat Hatteras Light in 1930. That's her at her launching day. Snow's built gorgeous vessels. This is uh, my grandfather aboard the, uh, the snow at age 55 in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. His second uh, favorite ship was the Wawanock, also a snow vessel. Uh, he was both her launching captain in 1907 and to 1910, and he was with her when she died, uh, when he returned to her in 1928 and was there when she uh, was wrecked in 1929 on McGlathry's Island near Stonington. He was the launching captain, which was a great honor for him. Um, captain Sharp also told me something really interesting that when the ship was on its ways, before it went down, they would uh, slather pork fat on the, on the ways to grease the skids. And so that when the, when the ship started going, it wasn't just the roar of the crowd and the sound of the squeaking wood. It was the intense smell of bacon, basically, uh, from, the burning, from this burning thing. I thought that was a very wonderful uh, story. My father was four months old screaming with colic in the cabin's captain, uh, the cap, captain's cabin. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right where the uh, Sail and Power Museum is. That was the, this was her glamour shot after she had her sails up and she went around the Rockland Breakwater. This was taken from the Rockland Breakwater. Beautiful, beautiful boat. This is her a little bit later on. And this is her 20, 24 years later. They were coming down with 500 tons of granite curved paving stones from uh, Corey and Sullivan in January, and they got caught up in a snow squall. So he, he put it her anchor, anchor off uh, some small little island near Stonington. And at some point, he, it, the storm shifted around and he needed to shift anchor. And in the course of shifting anchor, they got hung up on these little ledges just below the waterline. And uh, the, the Coast Guard immediately came out and and he said, look, we'll wait on the tide. The tide will float her off. She'll will go off. But his crew was having none of it. They, as he said, they bucked up on me. They wanted off. And they just jumped onto the Coast Guard boat. And you know, he had no place to go but with them because you can't have one man running a, a boat. And sure enough, they hadn't been on the Coast Guard boat more than 15 minutes. And the, the boat shimmied off. And then they started chasing it, storm-driven down the bay. And they saw it crash up on McGlathry's Island, unmanned, where these pictures were taken. They decided, uh, you know, by that time, no one was, was uh, insuring any of these vessels anymore because they just wasn't worth it. You know, the, the, the age of steam was coming, and, and uh, this was the last decade, really. Um, but they did insure the cargo. And so this is a picture that Captain John Snow uh, had taken of the recovery effort of these giant 1,200-pound granite curbstones. You can imagine working with these in the freezing cold in February. Uh, these are tough fellows. This is one coming off. <clears throat> and Captain Snow, was Dick Snow, told me that his uncle or uh, great uncle said to him, uh, supposedly at that time, I will never insure, an I will never retrieve another cargo, a wrecked cargo, unless it's gold or radium. <laughs> no more granite. Um, I went out to McGlathry's years ago, and I found near that there was the only thing left of the ship was a big piece of the keel jammed up under the into the bushes at the high water line. And I found these rocks. And I asked the guy at the Granite Museum what they were, and he said most likely they were chocks because you couldn't put wood between these giant granite blocks. The shifting on the water would just turn them to, to sawdust. So they used rock stones to sort of keep the load tight. Um, his favorite ship of all was the schooner the William Booth, uh, whereas his other ships could carry 400, sometimes 500 tons of, of, of stuff, uh, the, the Booth could carry 825 tons. It was still a three-masted schooner, but he made a lot more money with it because, you, you know, you, you, you made money with the volume. My father went to sea with him on summer vacations when he turned 16. So of all these pictures that are following are ones that were my father took and that I found in my attic, my mother's attic in a, in a matchbox, uh, having sat in this attic for 80 years, these negatives. And I had these pictures restored. And these are from the, the William Booth. The first is when he was a teenager working as a crewman for his father. 
And then later on, when he was working in New York, he and a couple of buddies caught a ride home uh, from New York with, the, with his father. And I'll, I'll show you those pictures. This is the booth after it had encountered a uh, terrible storm in Long Island Sound. And it, it snapped off um, the, uh, the main mast. And then that went back and snapped off the mizzen mast. And all this gear came crashing down onto the deck. And this shows you the snapped off mast and all these tons of stuff. No one was hurt, a miracle. Um, and this is a picture of my father at 18, standing on the deck. This is another crewman standing upon the wreckage. You can get an idea of what a thing that must have been crashing down. And this is after being pulled to Staten Island dry dock for, for repairs. And then once they were repaired, they were towed um, down the East River, up the East River. Um, this was night, probably about 1925. So this was before the Statue of Lib, I mean, before the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building. This is, I believe the Williamsburg and Brooklyn Bridges. My father is up in the rigging, you can tell, taking this picture. Oh, you took it into that bridge. Huh? Yeah, well, you know, that bridge is pretty high. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is a shot, you know, this is the damage from spending 80 years in an attic, this light damage. But it does give you a pretty good look of the New York skyline before the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building were built. Uh, this is a Sunday. He's dressed up and ready to go into town. His finest on. His, this is one of his mates, most likely, also getting ready to head into town. Uh, this is before they had sunglasses and sunblock. You needed a good hat. Can you imagine how burned these guys would get? He's at the wheel. This is a crewman demonstrating what he looks like on the deck. And then lo and behold, boom, up in the rigging. And then this is my father recreating his father's feat of climbing up and putting his cap on the, on the ball of the mainmast. This is at one of the coaling yards in Amboy, in one of the Amboys in, Jer in New Jersey. So you can see in the center mast, that figure up there, he's putting his hat on and now he's waving it, showing off. Yeah. He once, my father once climbed to the top of the old, of the old um, water tank on the, at the Samoset. We have pictures that he took from the top looking down at the breakwater. So I definitely, as I said, I didn't inherit that. A good view of the beautiful lines of the William Booth. Uh, this is in 27 when he was coming back uh, with, with his couple of his buddies. My father's in the middle and these are his friends. He was about 20, 21. These are his friends on the left, the two on the left. These two guys on the right are Rockland sailors. So I, I've given about 22 of these talks and I'm always hoping someday somebody's going to say, that's my great grandfather. But I don't know who these guys were, but they were definitely local sailors. Uh, my father climbed out while the ship was under sail. He climbed out on the um, Martingale, I think it's called, and balanced and took this picture looking back at the ship cutting through the waves. Beautiful, beautiful shot. He's this, him, or him or one of his buddies up in the rigging. Climbing up in the rigging. That's my father on the left. He's, He's there horsing around. I, I'm sure they had a berth they could sleep in. And, you know, my father said one of the strongest memories he had, there was always codfish hanging off the davits in the, in the stern of the ship. Because whenever they were becalmed, the, lot, the hand lines went out and they were catching fish, salting them up. And uh, that's a good shot of that. This, I think, is a monkfish that somebody had caught. And you can also see all the lo loose coal on the deck that they haven't trimmed up yet. These are some of uh, the sister ships that sailed, probably coming out of City Island or um, Martha's Vineyard, I'm thinking. Again, he's way up in the rigging taking this shot. So that's uh, at rest. At rest. That shot, and this is my favorite shot because there's a man at, uh, up on the after house and that's my grandfather, I believe, and my father is taking the picture. So when I look at this picture, my perspective is just looking over my father's shoulder while he takes a picture of my grandfather. Uh, and plus the light of the sun coming through the, the, the sail, it's a great shot. But the, um, 
but the, uh, the, the William Booth came to a sad end. Um, loaded with 825 um, pounds, uh, excuse me, tons of Vinyl Haven granite curbstones. They were uh, becalmed in the fog off Chatham, Massachusetts at one o'clock in the morning at anchor when they were plowed into by the four-masted schooner, the Helen Barnett Bring, which was launched in Camden, hit them amidships, split them. The ship sunk in, in uh, just over two minutes. He got, all the men got off and they were taken aboard the Bring, which must have been an awkward moment. You know, uh, my grandfather told his children that when he confronted the man at the wheel, who I don't know whether he was the captain or the mate, that the man reeked of whiskey. Uh, which might explain why he was flying along, you know, at one in the morning in the thick fog. And, and uh, but anyways, when the when the uh, Coast Guard came, they could find the site of the of the wreck because the top mast was still sticking above the water. So that was his last. Uh, no, that was no, because the the next year is when he lost the Wallanock. So this was one year. This was 1928. This was one year, and that completed his four dangerous shipwrecks. But he would tell his children he was intensely f grateful that he n never lost a man in any of these. Everyone survived. And, and for him, that was the most important thing. Going backwards here. So, you know, as, with, as the 20s ended and the 30s began and the Depression started to settle in, the, the business for sailing ships was just shriveling up. His last serious shipments were hauling granite for the U.S. House of Representatives building from Hall Quarry to Portland, where it was put on railroad ties. And then he took one last granite roll, load down to New York in September of 1931. But he had to wait for six weeks in New York to find anything to sail home with. And that was just, that said more than anything, how it was dying, it was, it was the end. So the, they went into winter quarters that winter, expecting, hoping to come out in the spring, but they didn't. You know, uh, the ships that he was responsible for both stayed in mothballs. And his last act as a captain was to sail the Annie B. Mitchell and the George Clink from where they had spent the winter in Booth Bay Harbor down to uh, Wildcat uh, in uh, is that St. George, South Thomaston, um, and with the way they were mothballed. And the last, that, the last trip he took from New York, that last uh, trip in, in the fall of 1931, my father and my uncle came to visit him. They were working in New York. And they all sort of knew this was sort of the end of it. And this picture is a poignant picture of the end of the sailing trade. So he retired after 50 years at sea. He hung out with Captain Snow down at his camp at Elwells Point, that, that little camp area now, it's a lobster pound down there. Um, and Elwells Point's in um, uh, Spruce Head. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see it, it's it's a point. It's Elwell's Elwell's point. There's a little point that goes. Now they somebody's built a modern building, a modern house, about where the first camp. These were all Captain Snow's camps. Um, that first camp on the right. It's not a, right. Uh, an old abandoned pound. There there is a there is a big. I think it's still an uh, operating pound. It's still going on, isn't it? It's a working pound. But if you look carefully when you go there at the outer end of that point, you can still see the wreckage of that last cabin. It's, uh, that was Captain Snow's cabin. But you know, in his journals, he talks about hanging out there and cook, cooking up chowder and moving rocks around, planting trees, all with these captains, these re retired captains. And all through the 1930s, he's going to the funerals of all his, of many of his captain friends. Uh, it was really a poignant time. But he always felt, he told his children, he said, well, things come and they thrive and they pass away, you know, and this is the next. And he was really fascinated by, by Lindbergh's flights. He was, you know, fascinated by, he would have loved the space race. He was interested in travel and it's just a different way to sail, the way he looked at it, what he told his children. So, um, as I said, he learned to drive at 69. This is him and Annie in, uh, on the shore at Stonington with the place they met, Mark Island behind them where they had met almost 50 years before. He loved to go fishing, he never used a rod and reel, he always used hand lines. This is him fishing with his kids at 75. On Sundays, he always made ice cream. I think this might be one of the prison uniforms that he's wearing, but this is him smashing up the ice to make homemade ice cream after church. 
This is him feeding his chickens in a three-piece suit and a fedora hat. Now that's, you don't see that anymore. While the sailing captains were also fading away, the schooners were as well. And in the 1930s, all, all along the coast of Maine in every cove and every harbor, there'd be these beautiful old ships just left to turn gray and rot and be set on fire or to be towed away and used its gunnery practice by the US Navy. This is the Marie de Ronde, which sat in Rockland Harbor for several years. It was eventually purchased and it was used as uh, for battery practice by the US Navy before the Second World War. This is a picture my father took of my aunts as they're about to come up out of the dory up to the side of the Marie de Ronde up this rope ladder. They look a little nervous. Uh, this is a picture he took of the Northern Light, a two-masted schooner that crashed just on the Camden side of the Rockland Breakwater um, in 1927, I think. You could see how beaten up it was. And these, these great old ships were just slowly, the attrition was removing them from the scene. Um, just a quick run through of the fate of his schooners, you know, uh, the ones he mentions in his journals, the Methabees, and it shows you the life expectancy of these ships. It was a tough job these people were doing under difficult circumstances. So some lived long, most lived short. Uh, it was launched in 1896, it was driven ashore on the island of Barbuda in 1920. The Matinic launched in 1901, lost with all hands in February of 1916 near Buzzards Bay, possibly by a German World War I naval mine. Um, the Wawanock, as you know, was uh, launched in 1907 and wrecked in 1929. The Emma Lord was stranded off Cape Henry in March of 1915. Marjorie Spencer was sold to Norwegian interest and lost to the record books. Uh, the Udipayans, uh, the, the uh, snow vessel was launched in 1910, wrecked in a hurricane between Cuba and Florida just nine years later. And, and the Lavinia Snow, again, uh, you know, wrecked, um, oh, you know, you didn't know about that. That was uh, wrecked in a, in a storm. Uh, William Bisbee lived the longest of all the snow vessels, 50 years it lasted, but its last 15 years were in uh, ignominious service as a party boat run by the ye old mystic crew and redubbed the Simon Gaspar or the Solomon Gaspar uh, and ran party boats out of uh, Tampa. It was eventually just hauled up into a creek near what is now Tampa Airport, where it rotted away. William Booth, you know, was wrecked in 1928. The Leonian Marion was one of the latest ever built, um, launched in 1920, and that sank near Nantucket 18 years later. The Annie B. Mitchell was mothballed in 1932. Her last captain was Captain Anderson. She sailed the coast, Atlantic coast for 42 years, and he sailed the Atlantic coast for 42 years and they ended together. Um, she was later towed to Hewitt's Island where she worked as a water break uh, to protect the lobster pound out there. And at low tide, you can still see the outline of her hull in the, in the sand out there. Um, and the George Clink, mothballed in 1932, refitted in 1940, but wrecked the next year off the Virginia coast. So uh, the ships were fading away, the captains were fading away, and Captain Anderson was fading away. This is a picture of his last New Year's Day. Uh, he had just gotten home from the hospital um, uh, before Christmas of 1939. The last years of his life were shadowed by cancer. And uh, this, this, and he wrote in his journal, this is the first day my, my wife let me outside. <laughs> this is, so he was happy to be outside. This is his last summer of 1940. This is him with his, some of his kids. Um, this cane that he's using was given to him by the wife of Captain Dick Snow after Dick Snow's funeral. Um, and he, he uh, used that till the end of his days, the connection to his old friend. He spent the last months of his life overseeing the painting of his house, of getting the coal in, getting the wood in for the winter time, making sure the garden was cleared out and his wife would have what she need. He wanted to make sure his beloved Annie was ready and when uh, in, in October, he'd, all these duties had been completed, he retreated to his bed to spend the last week of his life in bed, uh, surrounded by his loved ones and visitors who came to pay their respects. I always think of the Lord Tennyson poem, Ulysses, when talking about these old captains, you know, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the Western stars until I die. I think that's uh, a beautiful thing. And I think of him going over the horizon at the end of October of 1940 for the last time. 
uh, as I finished these li this large project of transcribing all these journals and writing this book, I was, was moved to write a poem. He, was he died 13 years before I was born. So I, I know him only from, uh, from you know, uh, the stories that I've heard. But when I was, after I inherited his, his journals and I was sitting in a library near his sea chest, and I was thinking about looking through some old papers and I thought, boy, it would have been interesting to know my grandfather. And it suddenly came to me, I'm sitting right over here in this sea chest waiting to be introduced, you know, all those journals. And that was the spur that got me to start working on these journals. And, uh, and I, so I wrote this poem and I'd like to close with that if you don't mind. Uh, the great old ship on the rolling seas, riding the wind and the waves, sailing ahead of an urgent breeze on through the nights and the days. High up the mast and the rigging and the ropes snapped by the billowing sails. Sailors wrestle with their fears and their hopes in the face of the gathering gale. Once all the sheets are rolled and wrapped and the ship's naked masts stand clear, the clank and the clang as the anchor is dropped draws up from the man of cheer. One young sailor stands for a spell near the top of the forward mast, watching the crest of the waves and the swells, looking out from the bow and the past. While below him the dancing deck slides away as the great ship rocks and reels, yawning in the grip of the storm in the bay in deep wooden moans and squeals. On the ships and the shimmering dreams of the night, on the stars and the rollicking sea, ride the hopes of a boy with eyes clear bright, coming back as echoes to me. And uh, that, that capsulizes what this felt like for me in, in doing this project. So I do have uh, copies of my book down to my last 12. So Christmas is coming, shop early and often. <laughs> and I'd be happy to answer any questions cognizant of the fact that the library needs to close in 15 I was minutes. I say that we are actually all out of time for questions if you want to wrap up tonight. But okay. uh, thank you so much for, for joining tonight, both on Zoom and in person. And thanks so much to John for a really fantastic job talking to us. Thanks for coming, everyone.